Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us at 14 Super Seminar Series. Today, we have Maya Brinch Loka. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, Uh, we have land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the land. The Omni Reunion Network's head office located on York University. York University recognized that many indigenous nations have long standing relationship with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledged its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Krakotel has been caretaken by and its bank nations, the Hudo Southern Confidency, and the Hohen Venta. It's now home to many First Nations in units and Medits communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holder, the Mississaugas of Treaty Nation, First Nation. The territory is subject of the dish with one spoon vampa belt convent and agreements to presently share and care of the great slave region. The Super Seminar Series uh, welcomes faculty members, Omni Reunion affiliates, and highly qualified personnel, including postdoctoral post researchers and graduate students, to showcase their research, promote their ideas, share their research experience, and establish connection among the various branches of the network. It is a platform to spread scientific knowledge about the One Health Research Framework and the research progress of Turkey plus a new reunion HQPs within the network scientific research community. These seminars facilitate knowledge exchange within Omni reunions, the emerging infectious disease modeling network, and the collaborating scientific community. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Our speaker is Maya Lutabret. Uh, Maya is a PhD student at National Food Institute at the Technical University of Denmark. Thank you, Maya, for accepting this invitation to have a presentation today. She's working with Professor Tyne Hill. She's a visiting scholar at the University of Wolf and University of Prince Edward Island. Her PhD focuses on strategies to reduce the burden of antimicrobial resistance. She's working with different source attribution methodologies and compartmental models to investigate the transmission of resistance between animals and humans to assess the impact of prevention strategies, such as vaccines. Uh, she's going to talk about source tracking of sporadic infections, exemplified with Salmonella and Campley, uh, Campylobacters. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, let's see. Okay, Maya, can you share your slides? Yes, I will share. Thank you. And then I will just need to do, do, do press. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, yes. we have a good look at it. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, thank you for inviting me to share some of the knowledge of the methodologies we're using in Denmark. Um, so yeah, I will talk about source tracking, and especially the source attribution approaches. We will talk a bit about the concepts, the definitions, and and the methods we, we're using in Denmark. So what are source attribution and, and why are we doing it? The definition for source attribution is the partitioning of human disease burden into specific sources where the term source include animal reservoirs. So often when we have a, a zoonotic infection, either it can be bacterial infection or, or salmonella infection, it can be very difficult to know where it's originated from. Um, and often it's only outbreaks where we have these investigation on and try to figure out where, where is the origin of, of the infections. Um, but then we have the source attribution methodologies that we can use to figure out what caused the problem. So we can try to figure out what is the most food, uh, most important food sources or, or reservoirs. So in Denmark, we're using it as, as part of our surveillance system. So we have this annual zoonosis report where we uh, describe uh, what is the trend for, 
for yeah zoonotic infections and and here we also use the source attribution to get an overview of what are the most relevant uh, reservoirs for for salmonella and campylobacter infections another thing source attribution can can be used to is to try to prioritize and evaluate different prevention strategies um, and I will show you some pictures later where we can can see how how it had been over the years in in Denmark. Um, yes, so we have that. So there is many different transmission routes for for the uh, zoonotic diseases um, and infections. So we have the three main. So we have the foodborne. Um, it can be either we don't prepare our food good enough, we can have some cross-contamination in, in the kitchen. Then we can also have some direct animal contact and here, especially the, the farmers and if we're visiting a farm, but even more, we also, many of us have a, have a pet at home and here we can also have some kind of transmission. The last thing can be through water and soil. If you go bathing, uh, swimming in the sea, you can also get a transmission from there. So we are using something called microbial subtyping to, to our uh, source attribution methods. And here the principle is that we compare the number of human cases this caused by different pathogens uh, subtype with the distribution of the same subtypes isolated from wired food and animal sources. So the idea is that we have some samples from animals and we have some samples from humans, and then we can compare uh, the pathogens we have and, and some of the genetic material. Um, so yeah, the subtype methods, they are used to separate the bacteria below the species level. So we can determine like a close relationship between uh, the strains. So with this purpose uh, is to finding like the evidence is related, uh, yeah, epidemiological related isolates, they also are genetically related. And there are some different uh, methodologies we can we can use. We have on the top, we have the serotyping, dividing the bacteria into like same species. Then we can go a little deeper, have the phatyping where we look at the serotypes. We also have some antimicrobial susceptibility testing. And then on the lowest level, we have the molecular typing. So we have some DNA band, uh, bending patterns, some like fingerprinting, um, and especially over the, the last I mean, years, the sequence methods has uh, grown a lot. So we have the classical MLST, the core genome MLST, whole genome MLST, and, and KMUs and SNPs. Um, so for this, when we go lower, we also have more discriminative power. We can, can split all of these uh, samples we're getting into more different subtypes. And the methodology, the first methodology I will talk about is this frequency-based method. It's the Danish slash hell model. So my supervisor uh, came up with this many years ago. Um, so it's a Bayesian interference uh, using this macro chain Monte Carlo modeling. And the idea is that we have an input, we have a, a data set of samples where we have observed human cases per subtype. But the thing we want is the human cases per source. So we need to figure out how can we estimate uh, this output from, from our observed uh, observation. Um, and the way we're doing this is we use this equation um, to get the expected number of human cases per source and subtypes. Um, where we're using a total number of source available, we are having the prevalence of subtype I in source J. And then we have two dependent vectors, the subtype dependent and a source dependent. But if we go a little deeper into this equation, so the thing we're showing is, so we have this prevalence um, of the subtype per source. And we need to figure out how the various sources correspond into the number of observed cases per uh, within these subtypes. So we need to figure out how can we how can we get get from these prevalences into to what we observe. And for this translation key, we need to know some some different things. So we have this exposure uh, frequency. 
So how much source is available for consumption? Then we have the ability for a subtype to cause the infection. And then we also have a, a factor of the ability of a source to cause infection. Um, so all of these, we get our values we had in, a, in our, our equation. We have the MGA, um, which we're getting from the data. We have our prevalence data, the PIJ. This we also can obtain from from our uh, from sampling, and then we don't know these two dependent source and subtype dependent factors. Um, so we don't know the ability for a, each subtype and each source to cause human illness. Uh, illness. So these are estimated through uh, Bayesian interfering using the Marco Chain Monte Carlo. Um, simulation. So when we go from this with these parameters, we can then estimate the number of human cases for subtype I uh, from source J, the lambda IJ we have up here. Um, and then we can sum up all of the human cases from food source J, and we end up with the estimated number of human cases attributed to that source. So going back to the equation, this is the overall equation we are using to, to, uh, to estimate the, the number of, of human cases originating from, from each food source. And this is a result from, from Denmark. So we can, you can see we have done it over many years um, and it had been based on different combinations. So we have both looked at zero typing, the phase typing, antimicrobial susceptibility testing, the MELVA, and latest we're looking at the core genome MLST um, and working with the, with that one. And as you can see, when, when you follow it over time, we can also follow what are the trends. Um, for example, we can see that in the 90s, Table Lakes was uh, the, the main contributor for Salmonella in Denmark, but we have, yeah, uh, And, and and you can the eggs in in Denmark are like labeled it's salmonella free. You can you can use the the raw eggs. So so it's a good way to to look into what are the trends over the years, and, and especially also if you use it for action plans. Where do we need to do something? Where do we need to put in some interventions? Interventions are are helping. Um, but yeah, uh, so this model, it has been used in many different countries and it has also been used for different pathogens. Uh, we have the Lysteria monocytogenes in, in UK and we have also used a lot for Campylobacter in, in Denmark. Um, it had also been in, in the last couple of years, we have also looked into E. coli. And, and in the resistance pattern, and it's some of the things I'm, I'm looking into in my, my PhD. Um, but earlier this year, so I published this paper where we try to compare different source attribution methodologies for uh, Campylobacter. So we use this Bayesian uh, methodology, and then we use the uh, machine learning approach, which I will talk about later. And then we used a, a network approach, but I will mainly focus on, on the machine learning and the, the Bayesian. Because when we get this sequences data and we get this more discriminatory typing methods, um, we need to look at the data in, in some other ways. So we have the core genome MLST, which reflect a little variation um, in for Salmonella, it's, around 3,000 genes, and for Campylobacter, it's around 1,343 genes, uh, core genes. And the idea is that we have um, each isolates, and then we have the different genes, and we each uh, gene get have a specific LL number, and this we can use for differentiate the different, uh, uh, the different sources. Um, so it's a recommended use for uh, epidemiological purposes, um, and if you don't feel the core genome scheme is enough, there is also these whole genome schemes we um, can use. 
Another approach is to look at these k-mirs. Um, and k-mir is a small sequence of k length. Um, so the example here, we have the seven mir. So the sequence is split up to, we have seven letters at a time, and then we move like one position. This specific mir in our uh, isolate. So when we're using K-mir, we assume that pathogens from the same source, they will share a similar frequency of K-mirs. So what are we then putting these, all this data into? We're putting it into machine learning. And the idea with machine learning is that it can find pattern and can be difficult to see with our own eyes when now when we get so much data. For example, as we can see here, we can see the the saber is very clear, but if we look a little bit more extra, we can also see there is like kind of pattern of a lion. And um, so that's the idea with the machine learning. Um, there is some a lot of different algorithms and, and different uh, the model we have been using is a supervised classification models. And we especially use the two algorithm random forest and logic boost, um, which have also been shown to work for, for both Salmonella, Campylobacter, and, and Listeria. But the idea with the supervised classification model is that we have a training set where each has to look at, it, they all have a label. So if you can see here, now we'll see if I can get this laser pointer. So if you can see here, we have a very simple one where here is more red and they are all chicken. And then we have some iso or pigs. So the idea is that the machine learning learn is, uh, is this label and this red pattern is, is this chicken label. And then we have a testing set that we can put in and it can we can then get an accuracy of how good is the model? How good is it then to predict the correct one? And then in the end for, for our final data, we can put in some human data um, and then it can, can say, okay, so the first isolate we're going through, it has the pattern of, so I would predict it's a pig, the next two will be a chicken and so on. So that's the, the idea with the machine learning. So what we have been doing is that we are using all of our uh, um, some feature reduction to only if we have, for example, present in all of the samples, it doesn't really say anything of, of the data. So we have some feature reduction to only have the the genes or the cameras that say most about our data um, where the machine learning model can learn the most. And then, at least in Denmark, I think it's it's often the way it, we're not very good at sampling equal size of all, all things. So it, we have a very imbalanced data set. Um, in Denmark, we have a lot of, for the Campylobacter, we have a lot of chicken isolates and then not so much with, with like sheep or or pork or something like pets, uh, so dog and cat and so on. Um, so we do some upsampling to better train the model. Then we having this split where we have our training data set to build the model and a data testing data set to test how good is the model. And the model is repeated. 10 times and we have some cross validation um, and then we can get like an average accuracy um, for for these 10 iteration and then we can show show which which of these two algorithms the random forest and the logic boost are the best and which one should we move move forward with then we construct the model where we put in these 30 percent testing data and we can again get an accuracy and and get some a uh, the specificity and the sensitivity of, of the model and, and a confusion matrix I will show on the next slide to, to see how does it actually predict our, our isolates we, we're putting into the model. Then we can build the final model where we use all of the food and animal data so it, the model will learn most uh, of the, as much as, as the data as possible. And then we can put in our human cases um, 
and then we're getting into this final model and we get a prediction predicted source of the human case. So to show a bit of the output, um, down here we have this uh, confusion matrix uh, where we have our predicted versus observed source. So it's a good way to see where is, is the model good to predict the, the the correct um, source and where it's, is it more difficult? So for example, in this one, we can see that it's cattle, it, it have it have some, um, some isolates that it's actually predict to be chicken from Denmark. Um, where if we see the chicken from Denmark, it has very difficult to split it between the cattle and, and, and the, and the chicken, both from Denmark and an imported chicken. And this is a general uh, a thing we have in Campylobacter, it, that it can be difficult to, to divide these, uh, the cattle and the chicken. The good thing with the, with the machine learning is that we also get a probability for each human case. So this is just for to show for a salmonella. I don't have this plot for Campylobacter, unfortunately. But on the x-axis, we see the, the cases. So we have one bar that correspond to one human case. And then on the y-axis, we have the source probability. So as you can see here, we have a lot of cases here that are shown to be almost 100% predicted to be from pick from Denmark. But then we have over here, it's more, um, now I can see. It's it's more like 50-50, it's it picks from Denmark or is it broiler? Um, so it's it's a very good way to show and to dive into your data and see how is how is each case actually predicted? Where is it? Um is it very like 70% uh, or is it very split? So we don't really really can say anything because it's split between two or three sources. Um, so this is a, a, a really nice uh, thing with the machine learning. So if we look at our results from, from our comparison um, of the Bayesian and the machine learning model, we can see that chicken from Denmark is the overall source in, in, in Denmark, is the ma major source in, in Denmark, in Kampler Bacter in Denmark. And then we have cattle from Denmark and chicken, imported chicken, there's 14 here. So these three are like the main, main contributors to, to complete back to cases, uh, the sporadic cases in, in Denmark. Um, and it, we can see it show the same picture if we're using the seven mir, five mir, or a core genome MLST. Um, when we're looking at the Bayesian modeling, it's also the same chicken is still the, the, the highest, uh, the major source. Um, but we can also see here we have the production, uh, some samples from production environment. And then they showed uh, a higher number here. A uh, reason for this is so the input we used for the Bayesian model was actually the output for the network analysis. So we have all these uh, these clusters um and because the bayesian takes some like prior knowledge so we can have here a cluster where we have a lot of human cases and then we only have the production environment and then in the bayesian modeling it will take all of these cases and put it to production environment because they don't share a uh, any relation with some of the other sources. So that's a, a reason why we, we see a higher number for, for the Bayesian here in the production environment. Another thing we can see for the Bayesian is that we have a lot of samples that are not included in our, our model, a lot of cases that, that we can't include. Um, and that's because when we're having a Bayesian and have these, we need to have subtypes where we both have a human case and a source present. So if we see over here, we have a lot of, of human cases that are alone. We also have some, it's all the blue crosses. We also have some where it's like only a group of two. Um, so all of these, we can't really use for anything because we can't 
they they don't share information with with any other so so that's a like downside for the bayesian modeling that we often have to take some data away to put into to the bayesian uh, modeling um yes so if we go to some uh takeaways uh Overall, the model predictions, they are giving the same pictures. Um, it Both the different methodologies, but also the different input data. Um, so if we look, I think choosing the model is, is all of us is coming down to what is the data you have. Because for the machine learning, you need to have a certain amount of data. You need to have some some differences in your data. Um, I have tried a little bit to see if I could do a machine learning model with resistant data, um, but there is there there isn't for now. I don't have enough variety in my data to actually get something meaning, meaningful out of out of the modeling. Um, so for this is more using the Bayesian approach. But if you are having uh, using whole genome sequencing and have the core genome MLST, k near even the 7 Lucy MLST is, is also uh, often used, then a machine learning could be be a way. The thing we need to be careful with, with at least core genome MLST and, and k -near. so core genome MLST, it's well-established methodologies, but often we have um, some problems with missing values because when we are getting these different allele numbers. If we have a, a type that is not seen before, we don't get any output. We can also have that the data is not good enough, the quality is not good enough, so we don't get any uh, yeah, feedback from, from running the core genome MLST. So, so all of these missing values, we need to impute this. And it, it's taking some time to, to do that and, and trying to figure out some different ways to do it. Um, but it, it is time consuming. Um, another thing, so we on the other hand, we have the k -mears. They are much more flexible because we can have a three mirror, we can have a five mirror, seven mirror. Um, you can also have like 21 or 32 mirror. The, the downside with the k -mear is that we, very quickly give, give get massive data um so it's a it's a hurdle there that that we're also looking into in Denmark how can we optimize our scripts and so on to actually run and not run into like computational uh, problems um so there is some some things you need to to consider um especially also working with this this machine learning um and, and this massive data. Um, other, another thing that is really important to mention when doing these source attribution is that the model can only predict the source that we're giving to them. So for example, we could see chicken uh, is predicted as the most important source in Denmark. And unfortunately, it's also then coming into a loop. So it's reflected in the sampling. So we have in Denmark, we have more and more focus to sample from chickens. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just, if we only put chicken in, if we have at some point and we only have chicken, that's the only source we can can predict. So it's, it's a very good idea to have at least a little, little bit of, yeah, some, some samples from different sources, because if we have 10 different sources, we also have the availability to predict uh, these 10 different sources. Um, yeah. And for next step is, uh, I have working a lot, and especially here when I'm in, in Canada, I have been working on doing this source tracking across multiple sites, because at least in Denmark, we have a lot of uh, importation of, of food from, from other countries. And, and we have some data where we, some can be back to uh, data from a lot of different of the European countries. So it could be really interesting to see how our 
how are the transmission actually across borders? But it could also, of course, here in Canada, it could maybe be instead of like, it, of course, we could have something between the US and Canada, but also just between the different regions and, and the transportation um, between here. So that's what... Uh, that's what I'm working on currently, and uh, hopefully I will get some some exciting uh, results. So yeah, let's go on to say thank you for your attention. Um, I want to thank my supervisors. Uh, they are not here, but but back in Denmark, and especially thanks to Jane Parmley and Julia Sanchez for uh, having me here in in Canada. It has uh, really been a, in a been a pleasure to 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 stay here and learned a lot. Thank you, Maya. Thank you for your interesting and informative talk. It was very great to you, and I really enjoyed it by myself. Okay, let's see. Any comment, any suggestion? Please raise your hand. I can call you. And if you're not comfortable, you can put your questions in the chat, and I will read it for you. Questions, comments? Okay, I by myself has uh, two questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, could you please go to slide 22? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's here. Uh, uh, I would like to know which of these uh, 5MR or KMR uh, are more efficient or um, we, uh, for basing our conclusion, you know, uh, I mean that there is an increasing trend for 5MR and, you know, I mean, why you, we prefer to stop at 7MR, not why, as you mentioned, 21MR, you know, which one yeah, is more so, efficient for having conclusion? Yeah. So I can't remember the reference, but some are saying that I think it's 21 mir that should be the optimal for a Campylobacter, but yeah, I, I don't know really why. The reason why we stopped at 7 mir it was back when I did this, uh, we didn't have the computer power to go higher. Um, and it's something we are working on how to to actually go. Because we can see other people have been doing it, but we don't know how. Um, one reference is like just, oh, yeah, we removed... Uh, 99 percent um but yeah we we are a little more careful to see like okay what are we removing because maybe we remove some of the important knowledge of 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 the data um so it's something we're working on but it seems like 21 years to see be the optimal for for Cambly but i i don't know why and i i haven't been able to explore it myself that high um so yeah, that's why we only had the, the seven year. Thank um, you, thank you very much. Yeah, we have a question in the chat. William wants it to have uh, a copy of the presentation slides. Uh, William, the talk is shared on the HQP Omni Reunion Super Seminar. You can find it on YouTube too. So you will have access uh, via them. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, I think Joseph has a question. Okay, Joseph. Yeah, Maja, thank you for the talk. Yeah, so I'm wondering, well, this is really not my area, so I don't know much of this, but yeah, so do you consider spill, spillovers like from diseases from, I don't know whether that is part of your research, but I was wondering, does your study consider like diseases from animals to humans, that kind of thing, but you consider that also in your study? Yeah, so the source attribution I have presented today is mainly that we have some human cases and then we try to find what is the food or animal source. Um, and that's the thing. So that's also what I'm going to look at in my PhD is that we can also, for example, for E. coli, 
we more have some human human transmission um so that's where we're going more into the compartment model um oh. having the transmission also because this is this is very much only one way so it's from animal to human but it, there can also be the other way we we, oh. do, we don't know that um so that's the thing in in the compartment modeling that we want to have this multi-directional so we can can see um is it also going the other ways from humans to to animals and and humans in between thank you yeah. I see another question in the chat. She did ask, uh, can you run source attribution on accessory genes that would cover horizontally transmitted genes, particularly in E. coli and Salmonella? I guess you could. So so the main idea is that I I have tried to run it a bit on, on yeah, resistant genes. Um and for I can do it for the Bayesian modeling. So here it's it's a little bit easier because you can have some some fewer like groups and then split it into these groups. Um, so yeah, I, I think it will be be possible to to do it. Great, thank you, thank you, Shizu, thank you, Maya. Okay. Uh, I by myself I'm curious to know how long does it take for um training data uh, i would like to know the size of your data so i think for my data here we had around 1500 isolates for the danish data um and so that's also i think so for the the core genome mlst because if you have i can if we go back here um so if we look at locus one we can have it's not because two and four needs to be closely related so we need to do it as like factors and it's taking some time um to run it uh i think it took a couple of days to run it uh back when i did it um but here's the good thing with the seven years because it's a count then it's just a number so one and two are closely related and compared to one and hundred. So it went much more faster. I think it was like 10 minutes to to run the model. Um so yeah. So it's it's a little bit about your data. Um so that's also why I'm looking more into uh, also using the K-MIR forward for the Cambly Bacteria because it's just quicker. Um wow. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. In case you want to have access to the this uh, presentation, this is recorded. It will be uploaded on uh, the HQT, the Omni Reunion Super Reader Seminars website. You can have access for going through the details. Yeah, we have some appreciations in the chats too. We still have time. In case you have any suggestion or question, please do not hesitate to share with us. And I see. Thank you. And if there is any more comments or questions, I don't think any more. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today. We are looking forward to see you for the next Amir Union seminar for the next two weeks. Thank you, Maya, for the great talk. It Thank was you. very informative and it brights us and it brings us many new questions. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.